So thanks for being with us tonight, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Um, men and domestic violence, there's so many directions we can take this. Um, so many. <laughs> um, I think of it from, and I'm going to use some words that might not even be right, um, from the perspective of the person doing the violence or, or the abuser and the victim, uh, the survivor. So be, I guess before we start, what's the right language to be using here? That's a great question. So the language that we choose to use at Willow is survivor. Um, sometimes we use thriver as well. Um, we, we tend not to use victim just as a, a blanket there um, and use survivor instead. And the reason that we do that is that survivor is a much more empowering word. When we think about victim and people who have been victimized, you know, we often have this Kind of thought and image in our head of somebody who you know has lost a lot of their power things have been taken away from them and we know that survivors are literally surviving right they are thriving through their lives um so it's just a more more empowering term to use um that being said we'll use whatever people identify as if you identify as victim that's what we're going to say um if you identify as none of those things we're going to use whatever you identify with on the flip side of that, you know, we often do use abuser. That that's the word that most people are going to use. Um, we also sometimes will use um, the words people who do harm or people who choose to do harm, because abusive behavior is a choice of behavior. And we also recognize that um, there's a lot of people doing harm out there, and sometimes those are survivors in their past, in their current, or in their future too. So it's a little bit more encompassing of um, understanding where people's place is in their lives. Mm, okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so when I think about men and domestic violence, I'm, I'm going to, you're going to, I'm going to just vomit my assumptions here. And one of the things that um, comes to mind is how do we make men stop doing this? That's one angle that we can take. <laughs> it's an angle we can take. It is. Yeah. Uh, another one is men are also survivors of this. They are. Um, so, um, what, what, what's, when, when, when you have someone approach you about this, um, what perspective do you most commonly experience when somebody says in the same sentence, men of domestic violence? Uh, that's so complicated. Um, my role at Willow is, you know, prevention, education, and training. So, you know, we're, we're walking on both sides of this line of how do we stop this? How do we make sure that it doesn't happen or if it's happening, it stops, and what do we do when it doesn't stop, when it's happening? How do we help people? So, you know, the first piece is recognizing that this is an issue that happens to anyone and can happen to anyone. Again, people often have a lot of stereotypes in their head of who survivors are and, and what those folks look like. And for most people, that's a woman. Um, and it's simply just not accurate. Um, the national statistic is that one in three women and one in four men one in four men, a quarter of men in the United States will experience dating or domestic violence in their lifetime. Wow. That's an enormous number of humans. So we need to recognize that, yes, this kind of, I think, as a movement started with women, but it is inclusive of men and male identifying people as well. How do we stop it? Whew, that's a much more complicated <laughs> question. Um, I think, you know, in there's, you know, two approaches in that one is that we have to, to get to people early. This is something we have to talk about with our kids, it, young, really young. This is a learned behavior. It is not a mental illness. It is a choice of behavior. So we have to get to kids and get to folks early to teach them what healthy relationships are, what they look like, what they feel like, and help everybody understand that they deserve a healthy relationship. They have the right to healthy relationships and how to have those so that they don't have to choose to be a different way. So when you, when you say an abusive relationship and healthy relationships, if we can take a step back, what... Yeah. What is domestic violence? What What is it? How does it look? What does it look like? It, it looks like a lot of things. Again, our, our normal reaction and stereotype is to go right to the physical stuff. And absolutely, the physical stuff happens. 
that typically in an, a dangerous or an unhealthy relationship, that's the last stuff that happens in the cycle of violence. What we want to really think about is um, all the other stuff that happens. There is a verbal and emotional abuse component to this, and that's typically where a lot of this behavior starts. It is the name calling. It's put downs. It is demeaning somebody it is blaming and shaming and minimizing behavior. And what that sounds like is, oh, well, you know, Jeff, if you didn't do that, then I wouldn't have to do this. And why do you have to be so sensitive all the time? I told you I was just kidding. Oh, you can't even take a joke. And when you oh, hear that I kind of thing, like, gives me chills personally, like, oh, stop, Lisa. Yeah. It sucks. I know. Like, yeah. Yeah. But when you hear that kind of stuff over and over again, all the time, that's the kind of stuff that we start believing about ourselves that, oh, I guess I am really sensitive. Oh, I guess nobody else would want me or who else would love me. And I really, you know, have it good with this person. So we really have to, to listen for that kind of stuff. We have to look for behaviors like um, isolation and isolation is so tactful. Um, it sounds like this. Jeff, you know, we're in this partnership together and um, I really love you, but I really hate your family. So I'm not going to go to any more family things anymore. And pretty soon I'm like, you know what, Jeff, I don't want you going to family things anymore either. I don't, we don't like them, remember? And then when your parents call, we're not going to answer the phone anymore because remember we hate them and they're no good for you and they treat you terrible. And also these friends over here, I don't really want us to hang out with them anymore either. And I love you so much. And I want you to spend all your time with me. I just really need to be with you all the time. And pretty soon, no friends, no family. I haven't seen them and talked to them in months. That's how isolation works. And it's very tactful. And once your bubble is very, very small, I can do other things and I can weave other behavior in because no one is looking in anymore. We got to look out for that stuff. So domestic violence is not just physical. It's, it's no. very emotional, psychological, even, even manipulative. Very manipulative. It's, it's using, you know, if, if we're talking about an intimate partner relationship, um, you know, if people have kids or any kind of shared custody, it's using the kids um, and manipulating through the kids. It's coercion. It is threats. One of the threats that we hear very often is a threat to harm self. If you do do this or don't do this, I'm going to hurt myself. And nobody who's in that situation has taken that chance that that person's not going to do it. That physical and the sexual violence that we see happen in relationships can be a threat too. I don't even need to do any of those things because the threat that I'm going to do it is oftentimes what keeps people in the place and keeps all the other emotional and manipulative things um, working. That threat keeps it all kind of tech together. It's almost like the, they're building this psychological foundation to keep this person oh, um, stripped of outside influence so that they can just take care of it themselves, in a, but not in a good way. Absolutely. And pretty soon that person who's doing harm is their only source of comfort and love and outlet. Hmm. Now, yeah. <laughs> what about outside of intimate relationships in other, uh, other relationships? Yep. It works the same way. <laughs> the behavior is exactly the same. You know, um, obviously like a little bit different if there is, you know, physical relationships and sexual relationships. But when we think about family relationships, parents and children and siblings and in-laws, man, in-laws are like a whole thing. It's all the same stuff. It's all the same tactics that people use against, um, against somebody to control them. I'm going to give you a really super uh, relevant example. This is such a good example because um, it is an example of how somebody has used like every system to exert power and control with no one really noticing an intentional way. And it's Britney Spears. Hmm. Holy cow. That is what family violence looks like. And that's what labor trafficking looks like. So I'm familiar with this, but can you expound on the Britney Spears situation so that everybody knows? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Britney, um, a bunch of years ago, has some mental health issues. I think that that, you know, is pretty clear and that's fine. Um, 
and her family stepped in and exerted a lot of power and control over her and created this conservatorship, which she's been under for, you know, 13 years, I think it is. Um, but they literally are controlling every aspect of her life. They're controlling her medication. They've been controlling what she works, what she gets paid, what she wears, who she goes with, um, who she's allowed to see, who she's not allowed to see. They've hung the kids over her head at every single step of the way. She's been unable to make any decision. And that's because they've gaslit everyone, right? They've said to everybody, oh, she's crazy and we got to protect her and she's not okay. And she's not in her meds and look at all this crazy behavior, but it's only the behavior that we've allowed we've been allowed to see that's how family violence works everybody else has got some kind of other picture in their head and what's actually happening on the inside is totally different so how do you how do you see that and how do you how do you how do you pull it apart if if you're not in her family and you're i don't know if you see somebody at a function or you're mm -hmm. you know this is your sister um <clears throat> you know, that, that kind of thing. How, how do you, how do you pick up on that? It's looking for things that don't make a lot of sense. Sometimes, you know, it's looking at relationships that look way too good to be true. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Um, it's looking at things that make you a little bit uncomfortable and you're thinking, Hmm, I'm not so sure about that. It's listening for, um, excuse making and self blame oh, well, you know, this is my fault, or, you know, they just got really mad or upset, or, you know, they were drinking, this is how they get when they're drinking. Um, it's listening for some of those excuses. It's the things that, that don't sit quite right with us that we just have to start noticing. What we tend to do is brush it off and be like, I don't know why she puts up with that. And then we walk away and say, ah, I'm so glad I'm over here. If that's our reaction, we need to lean in a little bit more and say, hey, are you okay? Do you need anything? I want to let you know that I'm here for you. Mm, okay. You mentioned the term gaslighting. Yeah. What is, it? what is that? So gaslighting is um, the tactic of doing things to make people feel like they're crazy intentionally. So um, it actually comes from a movie from, I think, the 30s. The movie is called Gaslighting. And what happened in the movie was the person who was doing harm was literally like turning up and down the gas lights in the home. And the woman in the movie was like made to feel crazy, like the lights are too bright, the lights are too dim. And, and he kept saying like, no, you're crazy. This is not happening. And all the while he was adjusting it to make her feel crazy. And we do this all the time. Jeff, where are the car keys? I told you to put the car keys over here and you didn't put them there. Where would you put them? Why did I just find these in the fridge? I just found these in the fridge. Now, meanwhile, I put the car keys wherever they go, but I'm telling you that you didn't do that. And now I'm like, oh shoot, I can't even trust myself because I keep putting the car keys in the wrong spot. And that kind of stuff happens. All the time, hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's a tactic of control because if I can't trust myself, who am I going to rely on? This person who's always looking out for me and always finds the car keys for me when I need them. Now, this is a s strange question, but do people know that they're doing this? Like, oh, yes. They, they know that when they hide the car keys, they know that it's going to mess with their partner's yeah. head and that yeah. sub they can subvert and be in control of the situation. They know that they're doing this. Yeah. Abusive behavior is an intentional behavior. It is not an accident. It is very strategic. Um, there's this idea that it is a mental health issue, that it's an anger management issue specifically. It is not an anger management. Anger management is diagnosable mental health. When somebody has anger management, they're angry all the time. They can't control it. That's why it's an issue. They're, you know, Starbucks, Wegmans, the people on the Zoom call, doesn't matter who's in front of them, they're going to explode. But when we think about people who are abusive and do harm, typically they're beautiful, gorgeous people everywhere else. That's why when somebody comes forward and says, this person is harming me and I'm not safe or I'm not okay, we all go, what? No. It can't be. Not at least Nolan, she wouldn't do that. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. And it's because they've worked to create that persona so that everyone will believe them. And if I can choose to be great and wonderful everywhere else, I can choose whether or not I want to be harmful. So it is purposeful and it's strategic. So why do people do this? Where does it come from? You said that it's a learned behavior, but does somebody, um, yeah, where does it come from? We learn this from all different. <laughs> That's a great question. Boy, if I, if I actually really knew that I would be a rich lady. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it comes from a lot of different places. We learn it from the environments that we grow up in. You know, we learn it from the families that we grow up in. We learn it from our communities. We learn it from, um, you know, our, 
uh, you know, the, the communities that we're in, maybe it's our neighborhood, maybe it's our faith group, maybe it is our school environment, um, extended family groups, we're learning it and we're seeing it in those places. But then we're also reinforcing it through, I mean, certainly now the media, it's through TV, it's movies, it is social media, all of that stuff. It is really hard to find really good examples of healthy relationships almost anywhere in the media. What we typically see is a lot of unhealthy junk and some really, really dangerous stuff that gets sort of glorified or we don't even recognize, you know, sometimes what we're looking at, we, it, it gets romanticized. Hmm. Interesting. Now you worked in higher education for a long time. Yeah, and you said that's kind of where you got the inception point for your awareness about this, about mm -hmm. domestic violence. Can you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. So for um, 14 years, I worked in higher ed. So I was working with college students um, for, for lack of a better comparison. Um, for the last nine years of that um, career, I was the campus judge. So any student who was in trouble for something, you know, did something, had to come and talk to somebody, talk about consequences, do all that kind of stuff. That was me. So I was the person who was making decisions about like, you know, you don't go here anymore. Can you pack your bag? call your mom. You got six hours. Let's go. Come on. Um, and a lot of the work that we were doing um, was students in dangerous relationships. It was a lot of dating violence, a lot of sexual assault on campus, stalking, sexual harassment, you know, that whole gamut of things that we think like, how could, how could that be happening? And how, how much of it could be happening on a college campus? just as much as it's happening out there in the world. And pretty soon it became, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing, most of the work. Um, and honestly, I couldn't, I just couldn't be Switzerland anymore. Um, I said, you know what, I, I, I literally need to take a stand here and jump to the advocacy side. Um, it's, it's a really hard place to sit um, in the middle to support all the people involved. That would be hard to just be, pretend to be objective. You are as objective as possible, but not have your heart pour into it the way that it is now. Yeah, it, it was really, um, I was getting to the point where I was thinking, like, I, I can't be objective moving forward, or I'm struggling to, to think about how to be objective. And that's when you know it's time. Mm, yeah. Now, what about men's experience in mm -hmm. um, on, on both sides of it, uh, as the survivor or as the abuser? Um, can you comment on the specifics or the differences that m men might, or that you've seen in your experiences of men you've come across? Um, so there's not a big difference with men. You know, the tactics that abusers use, um, how we see those folks keeping that power and control alive and well in a relationship are just the same. Gender does not matter. Relationship doesn't matter. Again, if it's a romantic relationship or it's a family relationship, the tactics are really very similar or exactly the same. So, you know, the, the difficult part for men survivors is that there's such stigma in coming forward to say something is happening to me. Now there's barriers for like literally every group. We could pick like one human, ask them like, what's your story? And I could find you a million barriers in their story. But, you know, thinking about men specifically, it, um, you know, we've told men you're not allowed to have feelings, right? So when they have feelings and they say someone's hurting my feelings and it's really bad and it's, it's really cutting me down and cutting me deep, we go, ah, man up, come on get over that, right? So we haven't made space for men in those zones where that emotional abuse is happening. Um, you know, we've asked men to um, be breadwinners. So when we see that um, financial abuse and economic abuse, we say, oh, well, you just don't even have any control and we cut down your manhood there. You know, and the physical abuse piece is, is difficult too, because what, what do we teach men about putting their hands on women? Don't do it. Don't do it, right? And if you do it, whose fault is it? That's the guy's. It's the guy's fault, right? So if we have a situation where there's a male identifying person in a physically abusive relationship, and I'm just going to pause here and say physically abusive doesn't have to be punches in the face, right? This is pushing and shoving. This is... Um, I, I had a young student who told me about his aunt and his aunt used to poach, 
pinch him in the back of the arm, like on the tricep where it really, really hurts and leave a terrible mark. And it was terrible, but it was how she controlled him and some of his cousins and they would do anything and they would do anything to avoid that pinch. That's physical abuse is a physical manipulation of someone's body to control their behavior. So we can't always look at that physical piece as big knockout punches, although that does happen. So when a male identifying human is experiencing physical abuse, it's hard to come forward to say, especially if it's a female, this person is harming me. Well, why didn't you fight back? You're way bigger than that, than her. Why wouldn't you fight back? Because if I did, first of all, I've told, been told never hit a woman, so I'm not going to do that. And if I did, then it would look like my fault. And there's no way I can call for support or help or resource if that physical piece is happening to me, because who's going to believe me? How do you, how do you get around that? I don't know. You know, that's a really tough place um, for men to be in who are in those relationships. We think about sexual abuse. Let's, I mean, you go right for what hurts there. I'm going to insult your manhood at every single moment, right? We're talking about like, um, you know, it's difficult for men to come forward and say I was raped or assaulted, you know, thinking about women who are taking advantage of men and who are, you know, like, you're not a man, you can't get it up, you know, making fun of you in those, those zones, the places where you're most vulnerable. That's really hard to come forward and say, this isn't right. And I'm not okay. Hmm. Because everybody's gonna look at you and go, well, are you what's going on there? What's wrong with you? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of nodding, like, not, not shocked at that kind of response. I know it's a mocking response, but it, it it's what I would expect if I was in that situation and I came forward, mm. I would think, well, yeah, that's what would happen. Right. So it, it's as a side plug, it's great that you exist, that your organization, <laughs> that they, that they, because I'm, I'm sure that they're greeted with support in, in that, in that environment. Yeah. And we're, we're at Willow here. We serve everybody. Um, you know, we started our life off as an agency that really did focus on women, but, um, you know, over the years we just branched out. I mean, men, men use a lot of our services. Uh, we see a lot of men through our counseling services and a lot of men through our court advocacy services, um, seeking orders of protection. So, um, we absolutely serve men. They are experiencing this in the same ways as, as female identifying people. Now, you mentioned male and female identifying people, the LGBTQIA community. Yeah. Is there any um, um, anything to comment on there specifically, or does it kind of blend in with the other patterns? Well, it does blend in with the other patterns, um, but, you know, we know that there are – so. <laughs> There, there's a little bit of a danger in these next two statements. One, this happens to everybody and nobody is like immune from domestic violence happening to them. But we also have to recognize there are certain populations without stereotyping them that have greater risk factors for being a survivor or becoming an abuser. And our LGBTQ plus community is one of those, a much greater risk factor for experiencing um, dating and domestic violence. One in two trans and non-binary people will experience this in their lifetime. Any group that is marginalized, has less access to resources, is automatically going to be in a different risk category. The tactics are the same, but they do very little. Because think about if you identify as LGBTQ+, first of all, you have less resources typically to reach out to, to support you and help you that are friendly and welcoming. Um, and also, part of your identity is used. Are you out to all of your friends? Because if you're not, I'm going to out you, Right. I'm going to um, use you in this. I'm going to manipulate you in the sexual way because you're new to this thing. And I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. Are you, um, you know, what about your family life? Let's think about that. What about coercion into having children or not having children together? It's, it's similar, but a little bit different. It's taking that piece of vulnerability and using it against that person in every single way you possibly can think of. So there's a bit of an increased risk factor to being in that kind of a situation in the LGBTQ plus community. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. Um, so just as a side note, people are listening in on the server and they're commenting in with their experiences and without getting into any names or anything, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you're saying that's resonating. So that's, that's really good. So <laughs> why would somebody fall into this situation? 
how like I have like why would somebody fall like nobody chooses nobody swipes is- right on Tinder to think I want to go into an abusive relationship. Why why do you fall into these things? Yeah. How does it happen? Well, yeah. first of all, it's not a self-esteem issue. That's not a thing. <laughs> um, I don't know anybody who feels good about themselves a hundred percent of the time every single day of the week, 24-7. That's I don't if you'd feel that way, I need you to contact me and tell me your secret because I don't. In our moments when we don't feel good about ourselves, we're not thinking, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to go out and find someone who's terrible and they're mm-hmm. going to treat me terrible. We're going to do this thing. It's going to be terrible. And I'm going to struggle in it for a year. And then it's going to take me another year to get out of it. And then because that was so bad, I'm going to find somebody just as bad or worse. It's not connected to our self-esteem. That's not a thing. How we get into these things are two ways. One, because it's learned. So sometimes people grow up in communities, in homes, in places where they don't know anything different. They don't know what healthy relationships look like, sound like, feel like. And if this is all I know, then this is what I'm looking for. And we can't blame those folks. We just have to say, you deserve better. This, you, you don't deserve to be treated this way. This isn't okay. It's like the Truman Show. We got to pop that bubble and like, look at what else is out here. Come on, come with us to healthy relationship land. The other way that we get into this is because it starts good. <laughs> Almost never does a relationship start out violent or abusive, right? Because this is manipulative. It's, uh, here's my best analogy. It's the frog in the pot. If you boil a pot of water, you try to throw the frog in that pot, it's going to get out of there. It's going to try every single way to save itself. It's not going to stay in that pot. It recognizes the danger. But if you put a pot of water on the stove, put the frog in the pot, and then slowly turn up the heat with all those words and gaslighting and love and hate and abuse and love up and down. When that frog is boiling, it's already in trouble. And it doesn't recognize how hot that pot is until the danger level is so high that it cannot safely get out. And that's exactly how these relationships work. People will just turn up the heat really slowly until they've got somebody cornered and they are stuck. It's not, you can't just leave. I cannot leave. It is unsafe. There is danger. So that sounds like a, I don't know, double jeopardy kind of a situation where Mm -hmm. um, you you can't leave, but you can't stay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds honestly like a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It just sounds terrible. It's a nightmare. And we can't blame people for not leaving either mm-hmm. because sometimes it is, it's literally safer to stay. Like I, when I'm here, when I'm in this thing, I can see that person and I know what's going to happen and I, I can anticipate things and I know how to keep myself safe because I've been doing it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to stay here because it's safer. If I get out of here, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't see them. I can't track them. And then you toss kids into that equation, right? Because almost never are, is there like soul custody? That's, it's really sort of a misnomer that like, if I'm in a dangerous relationship, I'm just going to take the kids and we're going to have custody and like wrap it up with a bow. That's not a thing. So thinking about like, I'm still going to have to send the kids over there. And I don't know what's going to happen if I'm not there. I can't see them. I can't protect them. I don't know if I'm going to get them back if I drop them off. So it's safer for me to stay here with the kids, even knowing that it's bad, because at least I know and I can protect them as best as I can. So staying is is not a great option for many people, but sometimes it is literally the safer option than trying to exit. I will also say that when we tell people to leave, I need you to know that that's asking them to do the most dangerous thing that you can do. Most people who are murdered by an intimate partner or former partner are murdered within the first two weeks of escape. Most people are murdered in the first two weeks of escape. So when we say, just get out of there, just break up, we are asking them to risk their lives. I'm, I'm just, I have chills because that's just terrible. Because, and actually, this brings up a, something that I hadn't thought about that um, in my mind, I'm thinking you want to escape an abusive situation. But it almost sounds like you want to manage it, for lack of a better word. Yeah. That's what most people are doing. Most people are managing. It's called safety planning. (laughs) We do it every day. We do it all day long with people. I'm not ready to go yet. It's not safe to go. I I can never go. My community, my family, my faith tradition tells me I'm never allowed to leave, right? So I'm just going to manage this. Also, sometimes the relationships are really hard to leave. Imagine this is if your parent. Your parent is abusive or your adult child is abusive to you. Are you going to turn that light switch off to that relationship in total? 
that's a really hard ask of people. So I'm not going to do that for my children, but I'm going to figure out how to manage it and keep myself the most safe. Wow. I feel like I'm learning a lot. Things, thinking of things that I haven't <laughs> thought of before. Um, and the people listening actually have a bunch of questions too. So I want to switch over Let's to go. Q and A. Um, so is there a pattern of verbal abuse later becoming domestic abuse towards men? Um, I don't know if I understand the question. Is there a pattern? It sounds like um, escalating, maybe. Is there some kind of... Oh, it, sure. Maybe, maybe he means like early signs or something like that that would escalate into becoming more exacerbated domestic abuse. Yeah, I think that sometimes um, the behavior that gets like laughed off, right? That it's like, mm -hmm. oh, just kidding. Oh, you, you look so, like, you know, especially looks. Let's just go on looks like, oh, you don't look so good in that today, Lisa. Oh, I'm just kidding. You look great, right? Those little digs that quickly get reversed. We want to listen for those. That, that's not okay. That's how it starts. That's how I turn it up just a little half a degree, right? I, I crossed your boundary and then I came right back. We turn it up to a degree and those do escalate because then it escalates into you look terrible today and you're not going to wear that. Yep. We take all those things and we just keep pushing the boundary as far as it can go. Yeah. I just have this feeling of disgust because I've heard that before. Those like little half a degree comments where you're like, oh, that kind of hurt, but I, I don't feel like not severe enough that I can call you out on it, but I kind of feel bad about myself now. But let's call people out on that. Let's call people out on that. Hey, man, that's not cool. I know you said you were joking, but let's not joke like that. That's that still kind of hurts. Even half a degree that hurts. Mm, good call. Yeah. Uh, okay. Next question: Is there a percentage of men who've left a situation with domestic violence, or who have lost lost their life, or stayed with the partner? I think I think this person is looking for kind of a, oh, a statistic. Stats. I think. Yeah. I don't think I have good stats on that, and I don't want to try to make it up. Mm, so okay. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. To totally fine. Understandable. So, um, another question, why are there so few domestic violence shelters for men? Oh, that's a great question. Well, because we left men behind. So if I'm going to be honest, this started as a women's movement, right? Women were being harmed and to be clear, this, um, happens to more women than men that we are aware of. So it, it, women are a risk factor. Um, and women needed a place to be safe. And what has happened over the years is that we've just left men behind in the movement. And I think many domestic violence agencies and shelters are trying to roll that back and be more inclusive, especially with all the gender um, work and gender equity that we've done in, with the LGBTQ plus community. I think people are really starting to rethink their programs for a lot of places. It's literally physical logistics that we, we can't house men because of how our, our space is physically set up. At Willow, we were able to redesign our shelter so that we are physically set up to accept anyone. Um, but physically, logistically, it is very, very difficult for a lot of shelters to be able to accept. Mm. Okay. Is it possible for abusers or people who do harm um, to recover or to be rehabilitated? I love this question. I don't have an awesome answer to this. I'm a glasses half full kind of gal. So nothing is impossible and it's a choice of behavior. So if we choose to engage in it, can we choose to stop? Absolutely. Is that process really hard? Yeah. There are not, there, the programs that are out there are typically called batterer intervention programs. I hate those words so much. Mm. Um, and there, there's not a lot, there's not a lot that have really statistically proven to be very successful because part of the issue here is that we have to accept responsibility for our behavior, all of it every single piece of it. And we have to recognize and be accountable for every single piece of it. And for somebody who is used to the idea of power and control and everything is everyone else's fault, and certainly that person's fault that I'm hurting, that's a really difficult thing to do. And then to track that long-term, to know that they haven't engaged in harm long-term in their life is extremely difficult. So 
my pie in the sky is anybody can change. Anyone can choose to be different. Statistically, we don't have good um, outcomes on that. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, unfortunately. Hmm. Well, that's kind of a next follow-up question to that is what is the frequency in which women abusers are held accountable for these types of actions and women or men, I suppose. The frequency with which people are held accountable is, I don't have a statistic for you, but I will tell you from experience, it's not great. Mm -hmm. It's not great. Most domestic violence is considered misdemeanor. In here in New York state, it's considered a misdemeanor. It's not a felony. To rise to the, to the status of a felony, something bad has to happen. And I mean like really bad. Like putting my hands around your throat and strangling you till you're nearly dead and we have to call 911 is typically not really a felony. That's, that's not a thing. Right. So, yeah, I know, I know. So, um, it is, it's, we don't see a lot of jail time. We don't see a lot of really good consequences. And the other piece of the consequences is there's not a lot of good programs because what do we do? We send people to anger management, which we know is not anger management. (laughs) So, you know, we just don't have a lot of recourse, but the, the stats on, um, accountability are not, are not good. And it's, it's a whole system. There are so many pieces of that system that are like, don't work well or are broken. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even begin to pinpoint like one particular system or group. Mm-hmm. Now, what about when kids are involved? Um, so when kids are in, involved, kids are being harmed or kids are involved in the situation? Um, I'm guessing this person meant not being harmed, but are involved in this. Well, I don't know. It could be either way, I guess, if they're harmed or if they're just Mm -hmm. um, bystanders to the abuse of the parents. Mm -hmm. So um, there there are options for kids, you know, child protective services, CPS is always an option. Anyone can call CPS in any situation. So please know that that's always a resource to you. Um, CPS can be in the home. They can meet with families. They can speak with children. Yes, they have the ability to remove children from the home. That is never their goal. That's usually their last resort option. Um, Kids who are witnessing abuse and who are there, even if they're not the targets of abuse, we have to know that has really deep and long lasting impacts on them. If you want to go down a little rabbit hole anytime and do some research, um, a great rabbit hole to go down is adverse childhood experiences. ACEs. The CDC has some really wonderful um, information on ACEs um, and it, it really shows in videos and graphics um, how this kind of stuff impacts children long term, even if they're not um, themselves being harmed, mm. just simply witnessing. So what if, um, this question is, I suspect a neighbor or a friend is being abused. Just, mm-hmm. What do I do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great question. Um, it depends on your relationship with them. Um, I would ask them some questions, right? We, it's, it's very much like a private intimate issue that we always think, Ooh, we can't ask about that. That's behind a closed door. You can ask if that person is your friend, do you care about them? Do you love them? Did you go to their wedding and eat a hundred dollar plate of food? Then you can ask them if they're okay. <laughs> you get to do that. Um, you know, we don't have to say like, are you safe at home? Like your doctor says, we can say, Hey, how's your relationship going? you know, I, I noticed some things that made me a little uncomfortable. I just wanted to check in and make sure you're okay. Okay. That's great. I'm so glad that you're okay. I'm so glad that this is healthy and everything is good from your end. I just want to let you know if you're ever not okay, that I'm always, I'll always be here for you. Um, if we know that somebody's in a dangerous relationship, we want to be careful because oftentimes confronting it or, um, calling in a resource without a survivor's permission or consent can escalate a situation. I'll tell you, there's nothing that escalates a situation like the police randomly showing up at the door. That's our first instinct, right? Like something bad is happening, call the police. And I'm not telling you not to do that. You do you. But I also want you to just pause and think, how could this make the situation worse if I called the police? How could it make the situation worse if I gave you this number to a hotline right in front of this person? Or if I just left it in your mailbox? You know, we have to really think about how we can discreetly ask the questions and how we can discreetly pass along the information that's not going to put somebody in more danger than maybe they're already in. Hmm. Interesting. Um, 
another question. Is there a difference in safety planning for men and for women? Well, we um, safety planning is individualized. So it's really mostly based on the individual person and the relationship that are that they're in. So, you know, we're looking at like your physical stuff. We're looking at your emotional safety planning. We're looking at your work. We're looking at, do you have kids? Do you have pets? Do we have to safety plan for pets? Let's do that. Um, you know, we, we were really looking at that as on an individual basis. So if being a male identifying person is part of what is being used as a tactic of manipulation and abuse, we're going to talk about that and how to safety plan around some of those tactics. Hmm. Okay. So typically at the end of a discussion like this, I might ask, well, what's something we can do? But I know that you have kind of a um, compendium for lack of a better word, but you have some actionable things that if somebody's in this situation or they know somebody, things that they can do. Um, can you, can, can you uh, enlighten us to those things? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I have a few things that I um, often will give tips on. So first of all, just start asking people about relationships. If you care about that person, ask them about their relationships, make it part of your routine. How's work going? How's the relationship? How's the things? Just start. It puts, it, this is like a little fire escape plan, right? How do you know how to get out of your house? The reason that you know is because you think about it. Oh, if this is on fire, I'm going this way. And if that way is blocked, I'm going this way, right? So it's the same thing. If something bad is happening, oh, I remember that Jeff asks me about my relationships every time. I think he's probably a safe person to talk to. So just start asking, figure out a way that's comfortable for you and, and do that in your life. Keep asking. Don't assume that because somebody said, yeah, I'm good, all is well that everything is good and all is well, because things change. Remember, we're just turning up the heat on the pot and it was okay last week. It might not be okay this week. The number one thing I want people to do though is believe people. When somebody comes forward and says something is happening to me or I think something is happening to me or I'm just not sure or this is happening and here's all the things that are happening, it's this person. I need people to just believe them. Even if you don't believe them, I need you to just close your lips and listen, honestly. Mm -hmm. Because that is the thing I think at our agency and in our work that we hear the most is that people aren't believed for all those reasons, especially when I think about men, right? We already talked about the stigma and how hard it is to come forward. Can you imagine if you're the person, you're the most trusted, safe person, somebody tells you something and then you disregarded it, and then something really bad happened to them. And you're like, oh no, they told me that and I didn't believe them. Now I don't want to, I'm not trying to pile the guilt on you, but here we have to believe people because that's why. Because people don't come forward to tell us this stuff when, when everything is all good and they're safe. They come forward because they need something and they need somebody to listen and be supportive of them. The number of survivors that come through our service that tell us you're the first person who believed me is astounding. Because we know how many people they've told. We know how many people have witnessed things and still don't believe them, still question whether or not it's actually happening to them. Believe people, listen to them. And then don't feel like you have to take the whole thing on yourself. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be the savior. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to do anything but sit there with that person in that moment and believe them and then say, you know what? I don't know what to do. But I think I know some resources. Let's call this hotline together. Let's reach out to this person I know together and do this together if that feels safe for you. Can you do that right now? Don't make decisions on behalf of survivors. Don't just like, oh, you know what you need to do? You need to go to a shelter. Let's make that happen. <laughs> that happens all the time with law enforcement. They just show up and they're like, this person is in a dangerous situation. And um, so we brought them to you and then law enforcement leaves and they're like, can I go home? I'm like, yeah, we'll take you there. <laughs> so, um, you know, don't make decisions on people's behalf because the other thing about surviving domestic violence is about power and control. And we're taking that power and control away from them when we do that. Give them the choices, give them the options. What do you want to do? And sometimes you have to recognize that it's nothing. I don't need anything right now. I just needed you to know and I'm just going to continue surviving and I'm going to continue making it through the way I am right now. I just need to know you're here for me. That's a good... Uh... That's a good list of things. Um, so I appreciate your time, Lisa. Absolutely. This has been really great. Um, it's uh, it's sad that this is happening, and it's great that there's a resource like Willow um, and other domestic violence centers that are out there in the U.S. and the world. Um, so I, I really appreciate you being here tonight with us. 
thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate being invited into the space um, that is safe for men to be in. I appreciate you having the space and being allowed in it. Well, great. Yeah, thank you it's for awesome. being here. Yeah. Um, before we go, we have an announcement. Um, we're happy to announce that VM will be participating in Movember this year. Uh, you can help us help the Movember Foundation's fight against male suicide, testicular cancer, and prostate cancers. You can donate or you can participate yourselves by joining the official VM team and growing your mustache for the month of November or by moving 60 miles to bring awareness to the 60 men who lose their lives to suicide each hour, every hour across the world. So for more information, you can check the show notes or you can go to us.movember.com and search for Visible Man and donate and become an official VM bro M Mo Bro or Mo Sis today. So thanks again for being here tonight, Lisa, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thank you.